Hi, welcome to this round of Vet Talks. We're going to be talking about the ethics and safety in international veterinary work. My name is Sarah Weibel. I am currently a veterinary student at The Ohio State University. And as for a little bit about my international experience, I've been to Ethiopia three times over the course of three years, primarily doing research, but I also have given a few talks there. I have also traveled to Thailand and Qatar to present research. My main goals in giving this presentation for the most part are just to help you and your future project. I want it to be smoother for you, I want it to be easier for you, and I don't want you to have to deal with some of the same problems that I had to deal with. And so with that, let's begin. The key points that I'll be focusing on this presentation include what are ethics, why are you here, here meaning that country, some safety considerations, that are often overlooked, and then the key take-home points and just kind of summarizing what I hope you'll take away from this presentation. What are ethics? The human race has been arguing about ethics for thousands of years. I put a simple definition up here, but it's also more than that. Because when it comes to working internationally, it's your obligation to this project, to the society or community you're working with, and as well as your obligation to yourself. You should consider all of these components before you begin a project because when you're doing test results for things like bovine tuberculosis, which impacts human life, animal life, and overall just quality of life, having accurate results and knowing what to do is very important. These are some of the big questions I want you to think about and ask yourself as well as your advisor and your group members how you want to proceed before you get out and start your projects. So what do you do when the sensitivity and specificity aren't that great? When you're only working with screening tests or maybe you're even trying a new product and you don't have access to confirmation tests due to just the technological level of that country or just you don't have enough funding from your project. Should you tell the families that you're working with how and what do you tell the families? A lot of these people do not have a lot of educational training. And so what do you do if you're wrong? And can you even make these recommendations as a student when you are not certified yourself? And it's really challenging when you're working with something like tuberculosis because this, this impacts lives. This impacts their children, the rest of their family, as well as their community. And if you're wrong, you just devastated that family economically. You could have just destroyed their sole source of income. And you don't even have to do it directly. You don't have to take that animal to slaughter. They don't have to take that animal to slaughter because all that needs to happen is some neighbor to hear you say, their animals are sick and that you shouldn't drink their milk and the rest of the community will blacklist them. So if you're wrong, you just unintentionally destroyed that family's livelihood. And even if they go someplace local and get the results confirmed as negative, you still have that trust rift that you just created. And so when you, when the internet's down, how do you seek advice from your advisors or just where do you seek advice when you have no one to talk to and how do you have these sort of conversations without any formal training so this is kind of this this slides like my big plea please consider these things before you begin your own journey it'll save you a lot of frustration and a lot of stress because these are big questions that you're dealing with so that kind of leads into why are you here in the first place? Is this just an excuse to visit, visit another country, volunteerism? There are dozens, probably hundreds of companies across the globe that take advantage of good people that just want to help others. But it might not be the program that you really think it is, or it might not be having the impact that you really think it is. So please just look carefully at the program that you're thinking about getting involved with before you actually uh, hop on a plane and go to that country. Do you just want to see a third world country? Is this just an excuse to do some slum tourism? 
Is this more self-serving resume builder to say, oh, I've been here, 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 and look at all these things I've done? Or is it because you just genuinely, truly care about other people? So kind of going off, why are you here? When you join a research project group or you're implementing your own research project or you're just traveling with one of those travel groups that go to different locations, the goal should always be non-sustainability because if they're doing their job right, they're not, they shouldn't be needed anymore. They should be creating foundations and developing capacity within those local systems and infrastructure so that as time goes on, even if it takes 10, 15 years, they are no longer needed and the locals become more independent and resilient and they can take care of their own problems. That is what true success is in these sort of projects. And the reason I was emphasizing the non sustainability of your own project so much is because if you don't you get what's called the downward spiral because when you give something once it creates appreciation when you give something twice it creates anticipation and excitement when you give a third time it starts to create the expectation when you give a fourth time it starts to create that feeling of entitlement and when you give something five times or more you create that dependency no longer do they have the skill sets or knowledge or in some cases the desire to be able to do things on their own because they know that aid missions will take care of them. And so you really got to be careful when you're doing your projects that you do not create one of these. So here's a real world example. You see a group of kids while you're walking through the village and you think, oh, I want to do something nice. I want to give them some candy. The problem when you come back a second time now everybody wants candy. Now you're creating an unequal situation because you do not have enough candy. Maybe a fight will break out as some kids try to take something from someone else. And at the other, the part that's even worse is you're teaching these kids that if they skip school and just wait for foreigners to come by, they may get candy and money. And how does that help them later on in life? They're not learning any skills, they're just learning to rely on others for their needs. And so just to emphasize that point, there are numerous cases throughout the literature that show examples of un unintended consequences when medical projects or campaigns go over to another country because they do not pay attention to the local customs and just social cues that are over there. And sometimes these can have uh, harmful consequences on the people and it ruins the image of the program. This leads to unintended consequences. Some of them are obvious, like inappropriate medical care due to language and cultural barriers. Some of them are not as straightforward, such as poor follow-up or integration to local healthcare systems. Yes, you come and do a massive vaccination campaign against rabies, or you do a massive educational awareness campaign about HIV and AIDS. But if you don't work with the local healthcare systems to make that sustainable or provide information to the people that you're working with, telling them about these services at the local healthcare systems, what sort of benefit are you really having? You provided a momentary point of relief that has no positive long-term impact. And if anything, you created a negative impact because now people are expecting foreigners to come in to solve these problems and foreign aid missions to help build the infrastructure as opposed to relying on the local healthcare systems. And when you do that, that negatively impacts the local economy and it negatively impacts all those people who spent years becoming doctors and veterinarians and other healthcare providers. So you really have to pay attention what you're doing before you go over there and really understand the complex nature of the systems that you're going to be influencing. And I'll also warn here, the next slide is a little graphic. So just viewer discretion be advised. Based on this image, it's obvious 
how bad things can get when you try and go beyond your means. They were trying to perform a simple skin flap, a couple skin flaps here to help this child, but they didn't realize the blood they were using from the hospital was actually bad, and it resulted in failure of these skin flaps. So now you have these specialty surgeons fly back to their home country thinking they did a wonderful job, and you have these poorly equipped and not appropriately trained doctors in this developing country struggling to help this child. Some could view this on experimentation on the poor and it just ruins everything. It ruins the trust that those people were trying to create. It gets rid of all of the positive things that group has done in that community because now this one child has been so negatively impacted. So now I just want to bring it full circle for you. This is a family that I met the first time I went to Ethiopia. They were one of the first participants of our research while I was there, and they did not want anything to do with us. They told us, why should we help you? All you care about is your master's, your PhD, and your publications, and you don't do anything to help us. You don't tell us the results of your data. You just take from us and you don't give back. I was truly shocked when I heard this because I was not there for any of those reasons. I wanted to travel to help people and to have someone just come back. And essentially, it was almost like a slap in the face, really made me rethink how I want to do the research that I'm doing. And so we completely changed everything. We changed how we took the survey. It became a point of education. If a per participant got a question wrong, we would educate them. And so instead of just asking whether they knew about tuberculosis or brucellosis, we were then educating them about the diseases. We were also checking the quality of milk uh, using a somatic cell count reader. We let them perform the test. And at first still, they didn't want anything to do with us. And they were grudgingly giving us the milk. But I saw some kids nearby and I grabbed them and I said, hey, try this, try this, do this. And so they're running the tests. The one brother notices that, gets interested, sees some of the results. Oh, can we test another cow? Can we test another cow? And then he shows his brother like, look, look, look at these results. And then we went from essentially wanting to be shooed away to sitting in their house watching an Ethiopian Ethiopian soap opera and having uh, bread and tea because we were able to make that connection with them. And I think sometimes when people get focused on their research and their projects, they get so focused on the data and the results that they forget about the implications that it has on the people they're working with, which is what I've been talking about this entire time, how the people want answers. They want to feel important. They want to feel needed. And so by sharing this story, I hope that you'll do the same when you have the opportunity. So just to summarize real quick, set realistic goals. You should always focus on empowerment over betterment, teaching people as opposed to giving. And the community is more important than the research. And I believe by focusing on the community, the research will, will just come second hand. The last part of this presentation is going to focus on safety and things you can do to minimize your risk when traveling abroad. The things I'm going to be recommending here are all simple and straightforward and do not require specialized training. They're simple everyday things you can do to keep yourself safe, such as pay attention to your surroundings, just scanning for potential threats. You see someone that looks questionable, don't walk near them. Stay in populated areas, don't walk in isolated areas where it'd be easy for you to get jumped. Don't text and walk in a developing country because then that just makes you easier pickings. And always try to have a buddy. Try not to walk alone. And this is especially important for women, which I'll talk about more on the next slide. This slide is mainly for the ladies. Try not to attract unnecessary attention. Depending on what country you're traveling in, there may be a uh, more conservative guidelines for what is appropriate for women to wear in public. For instance, if you are wearing this in Ethiopia, you will
be sexually harassed by men on the street, especially if you're walking alone. And I'm also sad to say that if you're wearing pants and a sweater and you're walking alone, you can still be sexually harassed. So just try and keep this in mind when you're traveling. Don't share your Facebook with anybody and don't give your local phone number to anybody. And just, I wish you the best of luck. So on the same topic, more common sense things. Keep your belongings in a secure location. When you're out and about walking around, keep them tucked away in hard to reach pockets. Don't keep valuables in the backpack. Someone can easily come by and open it up and take it out. When you're not at your hotel, lock your suitcases. Just again, these are easy things anybody can do. I wish I didn't have to say this, but the fact that I've seen it means I have to emphasize it. Do not get drunk in a foreign country's bar. You can go there and have a great time with your friends, but do not get drunk because how safe will that taxi ride home be? In more questionable countries, kidnapping foreigners is a great way to make some extra money. And with that being said, anybody you meet at these locations, do not tell them where you live. And the reason I emphasize all these things is because bad things can happen at any point in time. This was my place that I was staying in in Ethiopia in July of 2016. This is my little uh, compound I was staying at. Right up the road there, riots had broke out. That was about 950 feet from my house. 400 feet from my house. You had buildings being destroyed, gunshots going off everywhere. And you had protesters in the street just destroying everything. So things like this can happen at any moment in time. Even if the place you're traveling to has been told to be safe, things like this can break out. And so you just always need to be prepared and ready. And so one of the first things you should do when traveling to these new locations is assess your environment. And this chart can be applied to when you first get there and when something's bad is happening. Simple yes or no. Can I stay here long term? Yes, stay put. No, move. Where do you go? And it's hard to provide an exact where to go because it literally just depends on where you were. The embassy for me was a plane flight away. Just running could be a little sketchy in a situation like that. Your home, your in that home country might be the safest place. That was a compound uh, that was protected by the University of Gondar. So I was safe in there. But when I was also at work, I was also protected and when I was at the public some of the public institutions I was protected because they all had guards so where you go really just depends on your environment and what's around you so some other things to consider is your shelter are you going to be protected from the extreme heat or the extreme cold or if it's excessively raining are you going to have food are you going to have water are you going to have basic access to first aid are you going to have telecommunications when all of those riots were happening and people were protesting and people were dying when I was there. They cut the electricity in my district. No access to internet. Couldn't contact my advisors. After one phone call with my advisor, they blocked all international phone calls. Didn't have running water. So I was in a very questionable situation that fortunately did not dissolve into utter chaos. But it could have. And so having a plan and knowing where to go and what to do in case something like that does happen is extremely important. And so with that being said, I just want to summarize some of the key points I have. Understand the impact you will have on the community and always try and maintain a good uh, moral compass. Focus on addressing their needs rather than your own because you'll be surprised that by helping them with their needs, how easy it'll be to get what you need. And maintain situational, situational awareness in order to stay safe because you never know when things are just going to unfold and chaos will ensue. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this Bets talk. I hope you gained something from it and I just want to thank uh, IVSA for providing me with this opportunity.